2019 City Commission budget meeting is now open. I would ask all of the folks in the room to please stand with the Commission and recite the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, Mr. Clerk, if uh, if you would please take the roll call. Thank you, sir. Commissioner Campana. Here. Commissioner Frazier. Here. Here. Commissioner Hill. Here. Commissioner Schlegel. Here. Commissioner Smith. Here. Mayor Pro Tem Reynolds. Here. And Mayor Stonehouse. Here. That brings us to the approval of the agenda. And commissioners, if I can have a motion for approval, uh, Commissioner Frazier. I make a motion to approve the agenda as written. Uh, may I have a second? Uh, could, or may I pro tem Reynolds? Second. Uh, any further comments? Mm -hmm. Seeing none, all those in favor, please signify by saying yes. 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 Any opposed by no? Agenda passes seven to zero. Uh, the only announcement I will have is to remind folks that this is meeting number two of four. Uh, the next uh, meeting will occur on August 21st at 3 p.m. Uh, again, in chambers, and the f last meeting will be Wednesday, August 28th mm -hmm. at 515, also in chambers. That brings us down to public comment. Uh, comments may not exceed three minutes per person. Please state your name and physical address when making comments. And use the uh, podium, please, to your stage right. Good afternoon, my name is Margaret Brum. I live at 404 East Magnetic and I'm talking about page 210 of the budget. It relates to the um, Presque Isle Marina and my questions are for the person presenting on that. Um, number one, we've learned recently there's gonna be an early pulling of the boats. They're gonna have to be out before Labor Day and I wanna know uh, if you've calculated how much that's gonna affect the loss in boat rates this year um, and also, uh, for the next year, uh, when you put the boats back in the water, um, I heard it suggested there should be a coupon deal for the people who lost the whole month of September fishing. And I also heard it suggested that if they can't get a coupon deal, could they get a nameplate at their slip, a temporary one, to inf indicate that that was their boat thing? Because I've been told reliably that September is the best month for fishing. So those were the first two things about pulling the boats and bringing them in. The second, um, I apologize to everyone, I'm about to demonstrate something. Would you all look at the back of my t-shirt, please? There's a tire. It's a tire that was pulled from, it's a tire that was pulled from the lower harbor. It was full of zebra mussels. I've since spoken to the wastewater treatment plant and they've assured me that the pipes that we use to get our water in and out are clear of zebra mussels. What I'm looking for from the city is a statement about the upper harbor, the status of zebra mussels. My understanding is there is one and only one fire hydrant on the island, and it's near where the animals used to be. It's across from the Superior Watershed Partnership. Mm -hmm. And my biggest concern is if that pipe is clear of zebra mussels so that if in the event they have to turn it on, that they can get the water through. So those are my issues, and it all has to do with um, the Presque Isle Marina. Thank you very much. Anyone else to address the commission? Seeing none, we can move right on to item number one, and that would be the consent agenda. Uh, commissioners, if I can have a motion for that, Mayor Pro Tem. I move that the consent agenda be approved. Is there a second? Uh, Commissioner Campana? I second that. Any further discussion? Further no. comments? None. Seeing none, all those in favor, please signify by saying yes. 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 Any opposed by no? Hearing none, motion passes 7-0. Item number two, new business, community services, promotional community services, administration, arts, culture, public affairs, senior services, tourist park, lighthouse park, marinas, and Lakeview Arena, and I said that all at once. <laughs> um, I would, uh, would ask as we go through the agenda that we look at focusing on those items that may be changes from the past or significant interest to us rather than always some of the boilerplate material that sometimes we, uh, we feel we have to get lost in. Uh, 
Mr. Uh, Mr. Manager, floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, just to start the conversation today, I wanted to just briefly answer a couple of questions that were brought up at the last meeting. Uh, the two I'm going to address, uh, you were uh, both sent some information. The first was related to how many citations were issued at uh, Presque Isle uh, this summer. I uh, emailed you those numbers back on the 15th and it's 203 citations specific to Black Rocks uh, so far this summer, um, which I think is significant. Thank you. And then the other uh, question that came up had to do with short-term rentals and I also emailed you some information back on the 19th. Um, the question was, do we have the one-year review and I think all of us got a little glassy-eyed because we did have the one-year review a year ago. This is, we're in our third year already, so it went by kind of fast. But if you recall, uh, last uh, late spring, early summer, we went through the one-year review and we made some adjustments to the la uh, short-term rental code. If you recall, the, um, for example, we expanded the uh, number of units per building from two, I think, to four. If you remember, it was the uh, duplexes were the only thing that were allowed, and we expanded it up to four, I think, now are allowed in one building. Um, so there were a lot of things that we did. Um, so we have no other plans for any uh, other reviews. Uh, we think we've reached a, a level of, of performance that works well for us. <coughs> and just to add a little information to that, uh, I think you're, I also forwarded you some information that we are um, up to 234 short-term rentals in the city as of last Friday, and uh, the cap is 250. So um, we anticipate reaching that cap probably later this summer or fall yet. Um, at this point, I don't think anybody is going to recommend that we raise that cap. However, that's certainly uh, something that the commission can consider. Uh, if you recall, part of the last budget discussion had to do with um, policing those uh, facilities and inspections, and uh, we're, we're pretty close to our limit uh, staff-wise with, with the 250. So, and then, I don't know if do you want me to, Mr. Mayor, do you want me to try to answer the questions that were at the podium as well? If we can do that succinctly, I think. Okay. I can start it. Maybe John can help me. But uh, um, as far as the uh, boaters at Presque Isle, we have uh, asked that they leave in September. We are prorating their uh, fees for this summer to include deducting or are we refunding, John, or deducting? Yeah, so our current plan is... Um, we are going to, we've asked the voters to kind of give us their their plan. So um, drop in the office, give us uh, their plan. There are some voters who are going to be taking their boats out um, in a timely fashion that would coincide with uh, what we're looking at. There are some that would like to remain in, and we do have a few spots here and there that we can uh, make work for the rest of the season. Um, and after we have all that information, we're going to uh, contact those that uh, are given a spot and work out the proration. The proration would be for uh, one full month for anyone that doesn't get a spot, and then we'll work out um, the details of, of <coughs> what that would look like uh, with uh, folks that did get some sort of mortgage. So um, we're working on that and trying to work on the best possible solution for everyone. Was there a second question? I, I mean, I can say that just through our conversation here, I, I think that um, well, zebra mussels can get into the intake, the water intake, and cause problems for communities, but past our filtration system, and that'd really be a, a question for, for Kurt Goodman, but um, past our filtration system, I'm not sure that that's possible. And that's a question that can probably be addressed better uh, on Wednesday when we'll have the utilities people here to address that. Will do. 
If you don't mind, I have a few uh, housekeeping type of items. Uh, originally for tonight, the library was scheduled to uh, present. We had a very last minute change, uh, so we really didn't have time to get the word out. So if anybody's expecting the library tonight, they won't be here, but they will be here on the 28th. Um, if anybody's watching at home, uh, again, I'm gonna show the uh, budget book up on the screen so you'll see exactly what we are. But if you wanna see it for yourself, there's a link on the city's front page of the website, which is at marquettemi.gov. Uh, at the first session, there was a question when I was talking about the MERS investment return. Uh, there was a question, what is their current rate? Because I had reported for 2018, they reported a investment loss of 3.5%. The most current information I have is if, as of the end of March. So for the first quarter of 2019, they returned 5.69%. And if you, what they call the trailing year, which would be from March to March, March 18 to March 19, it's a positive 1.39%. So still lagging behind the 7.5% the we would like them to get, but I guess the good news is it's not, not a negative amount. Also uh, at the last session, uh, Pretty much a last minute change to the budget was the rental code inspector position in the rental code enforcement department. Uh, I do have final numbers to report on that. Uh, we're gonna increase revenue by $9,500. Uh, expenses will increase by 85,500. So the net impact, which will increase the deficit will be $76,000. So the new deficit amount will be 436,000. And at your desk, I have put the necessary pages that need to change. So I just wanted to point out that one change requires five different pages to be changed. Out. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. So Thank now you for people know. The numbers on there. What's that? Oh, you okay. Numbers on yeah, yes, you. I did. Thank you. Yes. So now people know why my head explodes when there's a last minute oh, yes. change. So anyway, with that, uh, tonight, without the library, because John was jealous, he had to share the stage. It's the <laughs> John Swinson Show. Um, Blake's gonna start the clock. You have three minutes to present your budget. <laughs> if you exceed that, that chair you're in has an electric shock to it. Cool. So uh, take it away, John. You are within range of a taser, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm starting to get a little complex here. Well, um, thank you all, uh, Your Honor, Commissioners. It is an honor to present to you the Community Services budget for the 2020 fiscal year. Um, community Services, as you well know, uh, is Parks and Recreation, Arts and Culture, and Senior Services. Um, we have gone to Great Lakes, as we do every year, to put this budget together, and I'm, I'm extremely proud of my staff for the hard work that they've done throughout the year and leading up to this process. Um, they've done a really nice job of, of um, getting the information and uh, doing their, their duties throughout the year. Community Services works to help to make Marquette the place that Marquette is. And um, so as we present this, uh, keep in mind um, the folks that uh, are behind me today, the, the division managers, they'll be popping up here um, helping answer any uh, questions you might have. Um, and they've really done a, a heck of a job, and I'm really proud of them. So um, I guess without further ado, I'm going to try and keep this short tonight for Blake. <laughs> and um, First page um, is 81, and this is um, the promotional fund. Now, a number of years back, the promotional fund was set up to try and uh, save the commission a little bit of grief. Um, prior to its inception, there was um, a lot of different groups coming forward and asking for constant fee relief on any given meeting. And so uh, this, this fund was sort of um, put together almost as a, a grant fund 
with the process and um, and then brought forward every year with the budget. So it's it's there to help um, ease your your business throughout the year. Um, as you can see, there's not a whole lot of change in the total uh, amount of dollars being requested. And as a matter of fact, the, the most, um, most of the change comes from the right-hand side, which is the discount fee waiver, which is a little different animal. Um, that is really the uh, mechanism to help sports groups um, get some fee relief. And there's certain criteria that comes with that. But the, the additional dollars are really having to do with their additional usage. So you can see um, a little over $2,000 versus $1,300 last year requested by those groups. Um, of note, the last three in the, and I apologize for the uh, uh, 0 .08 font here, um, but the last three on the promotional fund side are new additions. Um, so Fresh Coast Film Festival uh, seeking uh, $270 for um, use of facilities. Uh, Iron Range Roll, um, some dollars for barricades for their uh, event that uses the Iron Range Heritage Trail and the Marquette Bike Path. Um, and the Boy Scouts, Girl Scout Troop, uh, 3622 uh, uses some facilities for their meetings and they've all requested um, minimal uh, relief on that. Um, one other item of note, um, you'll see the No Cayman on Ski Marathon. Uh, three years ago requested $1,500, last year zero, and this year $1,500. That's sort of an experiment that they're uh, working through. They had a, a stop that was previous to the dome uh, last year, and I think that they proved that that could work safely, but that the racers wanted to end at the dome. So um, all those dollars go, go toward barricades and, and whatnot to get to the dome. Any questions on page 81? Please, yes. John, once again, I see that the rail jam, the winter rail jam has zero. Is that a dead duck? Yeah, that is, and um, I think as soon as there's still some dollars in the um, in the the three years prior, so we left it in there. But as soon as those are all zeros, we drop that off. They mm -hmm. they're not requesting. I mean, it was a real popular event. Yeah, just I think they had the some weather killed it. Difficulties with the logistics of the weather and and so setting up on that slope. No, so no plans. Yeah, no plans for for anymore. As far as I've heard from the DDA anyway. Okay. Is um. Because I've been asked, mm -hmm. I have no idea. The um, but the sled dog race that forty five hundred is that? People have asked me how much it costs to put the snow back on the roads <laughs> and then remove it. Um, do we quantify that? If we don't, that's fine. I'm yeah, sure. most of that is is um, barricades and other things. I think they contract with Overstar for a lot of the moving of the snow. So um, I could look deeper into that, no, but I it's it's not levels. cheap. Yeah, it's I not cheap know. to do, but it's really, really a neat thing for oh, the downtown. Oh, yeah, I, I think it's for great. Sure, so. I had somebody ask me how much it was. Yeah. We weren't able to match uh, the private contractor as far as cost, so we costed it out, and they decided to go with a private contractor who probably is donating some time. So. Yeah, it's a really important part. I think yeah. it's super important. Thank you. Well, if there's no further questions, um, Page 82 gets into the um, cash portion of this. There are very few things that would qualify for cash, um, but we do have two entities that um, do some services within Marquette that um, have historically received um, cash portions of the promotional fund. Um, those entities are the uh, Marquette City Band and the Beautification Committee. Um, City Band's requesting uh, about $7,000 and um, Beautification Committee $15,000. Um, City Band's expenses annually um, exceed $27,000 and um, Beautification Committee, I know just their flowers alone when they purchase those are over $20,000. So um, both groups have other uh, 
funding sources besides the promotional fund. Any questions with those? So the beautification department, they just we basically pay for all the flowers, they do all the work, is that what it was basically? Yeah, so it's the flowers for Petunia Pandemonium, um, some of the roundabouts, the Carl Zuger uh, Memorial Garden, and um, the Tammy Dowdowski uh, Memorial Garden. So, um, and then there's a, a few other spots that they also take care of as well. So, so we, we pay for all the flowers and they take care of the flowers. Yeah, they, it's not all of it, but uh, yeah. But it's, it's most of it, you know. Yeah. So. Any other questions on that? Um, next up is Community Services Administration, page 110. Um, so Community Services Department oversees all the reservations, all of um, the facilities that are, are rented, the schedules that go into that. Um, and this really kind of outlines um, a lot of the uh, revenues and then um, and the, uh, the way that those, those salaries are split out. Uh, a couple things that I would point out um, on the second line item within the revenues, uh, 543 state grants, uh, $300,000. Um, that is the um, recent trust fund grant that we've applied for for the Kids Cove playground replacement. So that's a $300,000 grant that we're hoping to receive. We'll find out, I guess now in October is what they're saying. Um, and then the, the match is 300,000. So that's a $600,000 project. Um, and the matching funds from that are uh, being raised by the Marquette Playgrounds for All group. So um, quite a challenge, but I think they're up for it. Um, and that you'll see that uh, the private, um, funds on the last line item there, the, the additional $300,000 for that. Everything else as far as the fees is, is very similar to what we've seen in, in the past. So the city, sorry, um, is not gonna contribute on or maybe in time? At this point, um, the Playgrounds for All group has committed to raising all the funds. Um, you know, if for some reason there was a difficulty with raising those funds, we might broach that subject bring it back to you, um, okay. but at this time, they feel confident that they can. Um, there may be some uh, ancillary things such as removal of the playground that the city might be able to help out with. Sounds so good. Are you writing the grant this year, possibly get built next year, or what? A uh, grant is written and submitted, and I presented on it to the DNR last week, and uh, hopefully in October we'll, we'll hear. Possibly get that. money this, then you'll be working on it possibly next next summer. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. Uh, depending on the grant schedule, they seem to be yeah. a little behind this year. So, any other questions on one ten? Page one eleven. Um, this goes kind of through some of our stats. Um, you've got everything on here um, except the the um, actual big pavilion that's on the next page. Um, but you'll see the hours rented for all of our facilities here um, and the number of contracts. Uh, a couple things that I might point out, uh, the Berga Gym, the hours have um, kind of gone down a little bit over the last couple years and we've seen that primarily because the YMCA is not using it anymore. So um, previous administrations at the Y used that facility a lot more and I don't think they're in there at all anymore. So. Um, the other thing I'd point out is the contracted permits, um, permit administration. We're up to 65 contracted events through our office. Um, that is a lot of lot of work that our staff does to put those through, and you see those usually on the consent agenda. So um, some of them are smaller, um, smaller events that wouldn't get to you on a regular meeting, but um, we do still permit those events that take place in, in a park or on, on the bike path. A lot of them are runs. Uh, but we have seen an increased demand for public events and it takes a lot of effort. And then below that you have the, the rental agreements that we have out there. Um, 
and um, the revenue that uh, is associated with them. Any questions on 111? Uh, you have Superior Rowing Club. That's the UP Rowing Club, correct? Yes. Okay, the jump from seven hundred sixty dollars to twenty two eighty. What? How'd that come? I'll have to look that one up. Actually, I'll just have to pull the contract and and take a look at where that's at. Um, they have a couple of different things. They've got the observation. Uh, deck and they also have uh, beach space for their um, for their uh, boats so I'll have to take a look at that. Could I mention that observation deck that they rent as a clubhouse and I think the city knows this but and I've heard complaints from various sources they say the roof leaks continuously for as long as they've had it there's an overbearing sewer smell that's always there and they can't lock it up because city staff always has to have access to it. So, I mean, it's not a place that you can rent to anybody. And it's like, you know, so mm -hmm. I would hope that the rent's not going to go up on that because it's really a pit to, you know, function in. Yeah, we haven't we haven't raised the rent on that. Um, so I'll have to see we'll no see rent. why that number's the way it is. Yeah. We'll check it out. But why did it jump to 2280? Yeah, we'll have to see what the... I, I probably have something to do with storage of the boats maybe, huh? Yeah. Of oh. which, of course, they've got what sixty thousand dollar boats sitting on the uh, you know sand shore. Okay. So, I guess the one thing I would say with that building, um, you know, it, it was originally intended to be something different than what it was. So then, when the change was made in the middle of construction, that's when we got an observation deck and we got a drain put into it. And I think that's where the issues came from. Our facilities departments looked at both the smell and the leak, and. Um, short of basically ripping the roof off of it and then doing a different ventilation system in there it's not a whole lot we could do with it so um yeah I, I, i'll have to check on the number and we'll have to get back with you okay on thank you yep. which one of the pavilions is the uh or i'm looking at the, the big log cabin of it press trial hold uh hold one more page and then we'll, okay, we'll get great. there thank you any other questions on 111? All right. Okay, so this is 112 is, is where you'll see um, the uh, hours rented for the large pavilion. And we put it here because there are staff involved with, with that one um, that actually go out and check people in and out. Um, so um, this fact sheet really pertains to the ball fields, um, ball field staff and the pavilion attendants. And what I can say here, um, the hours rented there, the middle box, that's for the, the log style pavilion. Um, we're at about uh, 600 hours in 2019 is our estimate. Um, does appear to be holding steady, if not going up a little bit. Um, and um, do 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 do. And then below that is the alcohol permits. So um, this is, again, um, there is a $50 permit if you have alcohol in that facility. There's no alcohol allowed anywhere on the island uh, with the exception of the footprint of that facility. So if you have a gathering and you want alcohol, they pay a $50 fee, and that goes into a fund that actually is used for the maintenance of that building. So um, that's kind of how that works. Um, I guess the only other thing that I would say about this, and it kind of leads into um, the next couple of pages, um, ball fields, there's been some question about the ball fields throughout this year, and we're looking to um, sort of revise how we manage the ball fields over the next couple of years. Um, this year, we're going to be working with the user groups and determining if we can't change the fee schedule next year a little bit. Um, and we're also going to be enlisting um, our facilities supervisor um, as another piece of the equation to kind of help oversee some of the work that's going on in the field. So he's out there all the time um, managing his crew, so we're going to use him as a resource as well. Next year we may have a, a fairly revised plan for you. Um, 
for how the ball fields run. John, question with that. What's, yes. is the issue like just because we had like a couple incidents over the last summer, is that what you're referring to? Yeah, um, as we dug into some of that, um, we we're looking at the, the maintenance and how it was um, taking place on the fields themselves. And um, there's just a couple of opportunities there. Um, some of it relates to the heavier maintenance. So if we talk about Hurley Field, um, for example, um, the type of things that needed to happen at that field when we had the issues there um, really involve heavy equipment on the infield, which is something our department doesn't do. So um, by combining you know, forces with uh, DPW, we're going to be able to get that type of equipment out there anytime it's needed and uncover the drains and you know that type of thing. So um, that was really the driving factor of, of kind of that, that change. And it was a little late in the game to do it for this budget and there's some uncertainties revolving around you know how it was going to all flow so you'll see the full revision next year but i think our plan for the 2020 is pretty good john um the we've also talked about needing to have a bigger planning window a longer planning window for the redevelopment ready is that the place you can talk about that later or is that is the place to talk about that here well um so our department oversees planning for everything, parks and recreation, arts and culture, and senior center. Um, and I think that we'd work that in, you know, throughout the year based on the strategic plan and the other different plans that we work with community development on. So um, I think that uh, it, it wouldn't really fit here, but I'd say that we have ongoing planning initiatives throughout the year and working with the, um, Dennis and his team on, on that portion of it is a piece of it. Because I'm thinking about the investments around the band show mm -hmm. and potentially investments at the ball fields mm -hmm. that have been requested or at least discussed, I should say, um, and how that fits into the annual. So I hear that over the year, but then so it sounds like would there be a, I thought there was a comprehensive plan we had to put forth that was larger. Now I'm looking at the city manager. Where am I? No, the uh, for the redevelopment ready, we had to have a ten-year plan or something. Is that a rec plan? Uh, no, that's the. I think it's the the capital improvement plan. Yeah, there's, right. there's so we had yeah. to extend that. There's many factors involved in the RRC. Um, yeah, and it's the. I think you're referring to the capital improvement plan, yeah, probably, that, that is the which we have, and it also includes the, the economic development plan, which you're going to be seeing here in the next near future and right. different things like that. So how that fits with this is sort of where my brain was going. <coughs> so okay. Yeah, so um, we kind of plug things into the capital improvement plan, which community development runs. So um, that's a process we have. Um, a member of our team sits on in on those meetings and does each year. We go year by year. And so um, all of the, the capital improvements are worked into the budget each year, so you'll see those as we go through um, on each line. I'm say for tourist parks, say for Lakeview Arena. Um, we'll talk about the ones that are there through okay. this process, and and really from our side, the redevelopment ready is really about um, you know getting those capital improvement projects into the CIP and uh, you know placing them within in the years. The band shells, I believe, slated for 2022. Yeah, I think it's 22, 22, I'd have to look right, back on it. But it's, um, it's up and coming. Process and, yep. and that the um, that this proactive planning allows us to be eligible for more state funds right. and potentially other funding. Yeah, so best I know, um, we're ready for that. So. Thank you. If there's no other questions on 112, 113 is our... Um, fee schedule, mostly unchanged. Um, I'd point out at the bottom of the page, um, the uh, city park exclusive use fees are changing. Um, so those are highlighted in bold. Um, those are um, ones that we felt um, fit into um, the higher administration time that goes into those. There was a request um, across the board, any city fees that have a lot of administration staff involved with them, um, 
receive a 2% increase this year. So you'll see that there. Other than that, uh, the other fees remain uh, unchanged. Right. <laughs> you you'd be you'd be you'd be surprised though. Even at two percent, we'll hear about that one. Um, any questions on one thirteen? Well, if I could add just to that on a serious note that, I mean, we have all been around f when we've done that 10%, 15% to try to get us up to where we need to be. And it's just that in the last couple of years, we've taken the approach of trying to move along with the cost of living, the, the cost of 2% raises that go along with our staff and those kind of things. So we just, instead of doing it one big chunk every five years, we're just kind of gradually doing it, not, not across the board, but where it, uh, where it can be done. It'll hurt less, I think. If there are no other questions on that, uh, page 114. Uh, this is the Community Services Administration budget. So this is this would be where um, all of the staff time for planning. Um, you think about the Parks and Rec uh, master plan we just completed. Um, the citizen survey, ongoing planning initiatives, land use plans, um, the Maritime Museum uh, or the uh, Lighthouse Park um, land use plan, Tourist Park land use plan, those all have fit into this budget, um, as well as ongoing um, administration over all the rental facilities and software services and all that good stuff. Um, as you look through th this budget, um, I'd like to point out um, maybe first of all the the bottom line the total there um, if you look at um, FY 19 we did have um, we did have hundred and sixty thousand dollars in the capital improvement there and in FY 20 we have um, six hundred thousand uh, and that's for the playground project if you back those items out um, we're very similar, about $8,000 higher this year. Uh, a lot of that is salaries. Um, but also, if you look at 740, um, that is something that we have that's sort of out of the ordinary. Um, this is, we have $5,000 in there for um, cameras at Father Marquette Park. So these would be purchased and installed by our own IT department. Um, and this is really to protect the investment at the park that we have. We have a very valuable piece of public art there, um, as well as uh, a more heavily used um, central area that, that has really attracted a lot of attention um, since we did the improvements. So we felt that was kind of necessary um, to get that done. It, I sought at first to get that done with the trust fund grant, but it wasn't really something they usually fund. So. Um, and then the only other thing I'd point out, I already mentioned the six hundred thousand dollars for the for the playground. Um, other than that, this is a very um, very similar budget to what we've had in the past several years. So, um, any questions about page one fourteen? We're done. We're good. All right. Next up is arts and culture, and I'll bring Tina Harris up to um, answer any questions. And we are on page number 118. So page 118 is um, arts and culture fact sheet. And we have for you the revenues there. Um, I guess the things in the revenues that I'd point out um, would be um, 642. Uh, that has increased quite a bit, and that's um, we have started putting together a uh, bulletin for Art Week, and there's ad revenue in there for um, people that might want to advertise in that um, publication. Uh, and so that's 
kind of a kind of a neat thing that offsets some of the costs of that event. Um, the other thing I'd point out, uh, MCACA grant program um, is uh, we do have eighteen thousand um, dollars in there for that, um, and then we also, and that's really to offset some of the rentals within the the studio space. Um, and so that's a, a grant program that we apply for every year. Sometimes we're successful with the entire grant and sometimes they give us a portion of it. Um, and then we also have typically a capital improvement uh, piece of that, but we're not, we don't have a project for that this year, so. Any questions on the revenues? Got a question. Yeah. I thought the city was giving $30,000. Um, that, that will be public art. And so that'll be a different, well, that'll be in about six pages. Oh. So. You're in for an education challenge. Yes, I guess. <laughs> um, I guess the uh, next thing I'd point out with the authorized positions, we've done something a little bit different this year, and I think it's working out really well. Um, the um, arts and culture uh, part-time administrative assistant is um, still as yeah okay so we've we've split that position out how did we end up with two different oh there we go one for um, cameras okay um, yeah so we've split the arts and senior coordinator position between the senior services and arts and culture. And so um, that position became a uh, full-time union position um, last year. And really the onus for this was, and we'll talk a little bit more about this in the senior services budget, but um, when Jane Palmer retired, um, that was a union position. And at that time we moved the management of the senior center out of the union and we hired uh, Maureen McFadden and um, this position the union was pretty adamant about keeping um, the position and we saw the crossover between arts and culture and the senior center as a really vital uh, piece of our community and this position really um, works to between the two different divisions um, there's a lot of crossover in marketing, there's a lot of crossover in promotion, there's a lot of crossover in some of the administrative services. So um, Tristan Loma is the person that works in both places and his office is in the Arts and Culture Center. So um, you'll see that in there. That's a little bit of a change. Um, any other questions on page 118? All right, moving on. Um, page 119, uh, really no changes to the fee schedule for this year. Um, a lot of these fees we really have there in case someone, they're not uh, utilized as much as, um, as you might think. So a lot of times it's if we have an outside group that comes in and wants to rent the space. Um, Just I do have one, uh, is there anything to know now that the library is I know from the library side, the renovations are considered essentially complete, although there's now trouble with the carpet. Um, is there anything to say, <coughs> anything you want to say? I think I assume it's now done as well for you guys and anything. To, I mean, congratulations. That was a huge disruption. And I'm uh, acknowledging that, how much work had to be done in the past year to manage open, closed, here, there, everywhere. Just thank you for all that. And um, is there anything you want to say about the renovations for, for your space? I'll start that off and then I'll let Tina talk a little bit about it. I don't know if your mic is on. Testing. Um, the, the renovations were painful, but it was a good working relationship with uh, Peter White. They really worked hard with us to um, make the space work for, for what we're using it for. Um, and I think the end result is uh, much more user friendly. We don't have those extremely hot rooms um, that were extremely hot in the in the summer and 
really cold in the in the winter. Um, it's more versatile, so we can we can switch the spaces up. Uh, more user friendly as people come down there. Um, so um, I think we're really pleased. And the other thing that I would say is that that lease is coming up with um, the Peter White Public Library, and so we've been um, we've started the initial. Um, conversations to renegotiate that lease and that would be coming forward to you in the next year so anything you want to add yeah we're really happy with the the updated space and i think that the residents are really happy with it it's more professional it's more private um, we have now more artists using it they really feel like they're in a real studio just because it doesn't have such an open feel anymore but also one of the biggest changes was us having a real office before we were kind of crammed like sardines in one little office and uh, down a hallway. We weren't even accessible. And um, given that we are a hub, we're doing a lot of advocacy work and we do a lot of uh, work with the community, um, now they can find us and they have a professional place to meet and do business. So um, it's been great for everybody. All right, any other questions on 119? If not, page 120 is the actual meat and potatoes of the um, arts and culture budget. Um, I guess if I could skip to the, the total at the bottom. Um, really, if you, if you take a look at this and again back out um, capital uh, for the previous year, we did have a uh, capital grant for benches at the Banshell that we went through MCACA grant program. Um, we're pretty much at the same same budget as we were last year, about $1,000 above. Um, and again, that comes mostly in, um, in wages. We did have um, line item, let's see, count 900. Um, that was printing and publishing. Um, we are expecting to do um, some additional printing this year as we work on, um, I, call it, I call arts and culture our creative division. And they're, they're working um, to help um, define and um, promote community services in general to get information out to people on uh, rack cards that they can just grab and say, okay, I have a question about this, where do I find the answer? Um, so we do have a, a few extra dollars on that, and they'll be working on, on information for all three divisions. So I thought that was good. Any other questions on the arts and culture budget? Right. Now we're on to public art. So as I think most of you uh, know, page, um, page 133, um, we recently approved the public art um, policy and established the public art commission, the Marquette Public Art Commission. Um, and we're going on year two of this, so year, year three. three of this. Yeah, it's amazing how fast time flies. Um, but this is really, an opportunity for um, the city to um, work on promoting the arts in a very public way. Um, drastically different than the previous budget that we talked about. Um, the previous budget centers around our um, arts and culture master plan really acting as um, a, the hub of the wheel for the cultural events within the city. So a reference, how do we get these things out? How do we get people involved? Um, public art is, is separated in this way so that we can focus these dollars on things that enrich the community through um, specific pieces of art or specific works of art. Um, so think about Father Marquette's statue. Think about some of the other sculptures that we have um, in town. Um, really uh, an enriching thing for the community. Um, and I appreciate all the support that everyone that was involved in, in getting this to happen. Um, ongoing, the, the, the group has really been working on um, getting a lot of their administrative uh, pieces in line. So um, what's, the, what's the policy look like? What 
um, is the inventory and how do we uh, have the inventory um, cataloged and what's the next steps moving forward um, with Marquette's first piece of public art introduced through this fund. So um, a lot of work going into this and Tina's been doing a great job working with that group of, of folks and a lot of dedicated folks on that on that commission. So um, we're looking forward to great things in the in the near future. Do you have anything to add on the fact sheet? Um, no, just that uh, they are looking as soon as the policy and guidelines um, are reviewed at the um, attorney's office. Um, they're going to start looking at their first request for proposal, identifying places within the city, and you will be um, will be presenting to you at some point in this fiscal year to amend the budget for our first public art project. They have to take everything at step by step, so the policy and guidelines, you know, aren't haven't been officially vetted, and um, this this group is doing right. They're going slow and they want to make sure that they're methodical and um, take take each step as we go. In fact, we had uh, budgeted last year $30,000 for the maintenance of Father Marquette statue and um, they've said, you know, hold off because we need to have a maintenance plan and we're looking at other cities' maintenance plans and it's a pretty, you know, what's the baseline and, you know, how do you assess what the, d what the damage is, what's that process. So we're actually now putting together a, uh, a checklist process that each piece of art will have every year. We're photographing all these pieces so we actually have a baseline to see any changes. Um, so we'll be looking at that Father Marquette statue will be going through that very formal process next year. So we're doing it right. Yeah, they're really um, you know, dotting all the I's and crossing the T's. When Ryan Bryak uh, put in the, the sculpture at the base of Father Marquette, he was required to, to put um, with that to submit to the city a full maintenance plan on, uh, and he's like, it doesn't really need much. And we're like, well, the Public Art Commission said, let's take it a step further. Let's find out what, what it might need you know, 10 years from now. And so um, they're really doing, doing a good job. Um, so the budget um, and maybe, Maybe Gary can explain the, the calculation behind it, but it does grow a little bit um, every year. Um, it's at $31,000 uh, this year. It was at just a little over $30,000 last year. Um, and Gary, you wanna explain how that calculation works? Yeah, if you'll recall in the agreement, it's we started out with the base amount of $30,000, which was the contribution in fiscal year 2018. Then as part of the agreement, the, that $30,000 is to grow by the amount of inflation each year, and we use the same inflation rate that the assessors use throughout the state. So for fiscal year 19, which is the current year, that amount was 2.1%, and for FY20, that amount will be 2.4%. And then it'll continue to grow each year as part of that. It as part of that rate, it won't get any higher than 5%, but it will continue to grow each year as long as there's inflation. If I could add just one other thing to remind the commission that per the policy, any expenses, the expenses or the payments are gonna be follow the, uh, the commission policy. If it's over under five thousand dollars, I only need to approve it, or I can approve it. If it's over five thousand, any single expense, it has <coughs> to come to the commission for full approval. So, as we're looking at this budget on um, page one thirty-four, um, the um, things I guess I would point out: um, seven forty operating supplies. We have about a thousand dollars in there for. Um, solar lighting at uh, Father Marquette Park um, and we think that's appropriate for the new installation there. Um, and then in um, professional contractual 801 um, there is about a thousand dollars for um, branding and design uh, for the public art collection. Um, and then we have some brochures and the printing and publishing. So really some ancillary things there. Um, and then as Tina mentioned, as soon as we have the first proposal, 
um, that will be coming forward to the commission at that time. Would the map, I think as you talk about a map, is that still on the table? Yeah, we, we just finished um, our inventory and we'll be bringing a contract at the next city commission meeting or two, two city commission meetings. We have hired want to hire a photographer to document and they'll do the, the pretty pictures that you would see in a brochure and then of course the pictures for maintenance. But that then, the idea of a brochure could be a map of where everything, private and public, public art that the city owns, but then privately owned art as well um, would go on that map. Yeah, so people can come to our area and um, find, find everything. So that's in this budget? Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Question? Along those lines as well, <coughs> Tina. Um, the uh, that that that's where I was going to ask my question. So thanks for answering uh, in previously. But the um, the city's art is permanent in place. The the public or the, the other portions or, or, or pieces of art that are going to be displayed, those ones will be switched out occasionally. Yeah, maybe. I mean, um, for example, Father Marquette is there. It's considered permanent. Um, and it depends. We have uh, areas for art for the future spear dock. You know, that we don't know what that would be yet, but we would like to think that would be permanent. But there's some talk of art that's temporary or not permanent. Um, there's a um, especially ephemeral art that's made maybe out of natural, like willow branches, that can s will last about three to five years. Or maybe it's a photograph that would be up for a while, then taken down. But um, we're definitely looking at more permanent art and you know these these pictures here that one by uh, Sherry Loon's foot and then this one back here those are going to be assessed those are both this one's quite valuable back here and um, that will be a part of our collection that we have to take care of sure. and start uh, learning how to maintain it thank you I think something that's important to, to point out too with this is that um, any funds that aren't used are put into a fund for the future, thirty thousand dollars in any one given shot um, doesn't buy much. What's Father Marquette appraised at? I think to replace Father Marquette would be by almost three hundred thousand dollars. To bronze, for example, the Phil Nemisto statue, if we talked about wanting to bronze it, that'd be about seventy-five thousand dollars because the cast is there. So when you're looking at a substantial forever public art piece, it's it's expensive. So we do have funds from the previous two years, and mm -hmm. and when that first project comes up good chance that we'd probably be looking at some of those funds so any other questions about page 134 all right thanks Tina next up is uh, senior services page 158 And I have Maureen McFadden here. She's the new uh, senior center manager. So if you haven't met her yet, um, maybe later is your chance here. Um, so on page 158, uh, this is the fact sheet for um, in-home services. And this is the UPCAP contract. Um, so all of the dollars that we get from the UPCAP cap contract goes straight toward um, our programs that um, help seniors uh, stay in their homes for longer. So um, we have services that go out to people's homes. We have nine homemakers, um, and those folks go out and they, they do various different things from uh, assisting with cleaning, um, potentially some grocery shopping, any other um, non-nursing needs with them in the home. Just um, a great service that helps to um, keep our seniors in their homes for longer. Um, it has really been a, a well-received program and um, our uh, senior centers or senior uh, social workers help to administer the program and really do a very nice job uh, with it. Um, it does fluctuate a little bit and I guess I would point out um, in the program statistics, um, you'll see $71,265 there. Um, that is the contract amount for 2019, up from uh, original contract amount of $46,678 previously. So we have seen these contracts going up um, 
as the funds become available. And it is also a challenge throughout the year. Um, we set a budget and then in the middle of the year, um, we find and realize an increase, which is great. We have to figure out how to spend those dollars within the contract amount. So um, a lot of kudos to our staff that does a, a great job of working out all those details and making sure that um, the funds are being spent appropriately and in a timely fashion. Yeah. Do you have to spend it? Can't yes. save it? No. No, you can't save it. You have to spend it or lose it. And if we may I say something on that if we don't spend it then they won't allocate um, as much to us the next year so you never want to turn down the money um, so to speak That's such a government thing mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> but anytime the contracts increase we do have a need out there in the community for these so you know if we can get more funds we're really open to that um, but it, it sometimes just is a challenge with the timing you know you get within three months of the end of the contract and you all of a sudden have an extra $15,000 and it's like, yeah, it's just a timing thing. It's a great, a it's great, great service. It's great. So. Just tell Gary you can spend it. Just give you more money, you can spend it. <laughs> um, I think uh, of note the, um, the unit hours, you can see the increase there. Um, we've definitely increased the number of hours that we're um, sending these folks out for, so. Um, good news story. Any questions on 158? All right. 159 is the fact sheet for uh, 687. Um, so this is the allocation of local millage. So this is everything else, and including some homemaking. Um, so as you look down through there, you'll see, um, I guess I'd, I'd point out in the, um, in the authorized positions, um, there are, you'll see in the middle, senior center coordinator. Um, that was what Jane Palmer's position was, and that was the position that got um, uh, transferred into uh, the senior uh, arts and senior services coordinator position that's split between the two uh, divisions. And then the senior center manager, um, that was the position that we created to oversee the senior center. Um, Jane Palmer did a fabulous job and we commend all her efforts um, throughout uh, her years of service. Um, one of the, the difficult factors prior to this change was that it was a union employee that was sort of trying to see oversee other union employees. Um, not the most, uh, the best way to do it so we with that staffing change, we corrected that. And I think that uh, everything's running pretty smoothly now that we have uh, Marine on staff. Um, other points of interest on this, I guess I'd just point out, um, we did make a slight um, error with this, um, the metrics for um, FY 2019 in the bottom box there. Don't pay attention to those. We'll actually email you out the adjusted uh, fact sheet. Um, Maureen put them together for the first time and we noticed little inconsistencies there and then we figured out where we were getting those numbers from and then I forgot to put it in the O-Drive for Gary and he loves it when those things come down last minute. <laughs> but we'll get those that out to you uh, tomorrow. Every, all the numbers in there are good news stories. They're very similar to last year um, with increases in service, so. Any questions on page 159? Won't the senior donors help Mike eventually? <laughs> no comment. Uh, page 160. Um, so this is the, all the revenues for the senior center in the top portion here. Um, that first um, first two line items are, are the um, the local millage, um, so that's what we receive through property taxes here in the city. Um, the uh, state home care service line item uh, that's uh, 543. That's the upcap contract for um, in-home services. And you can see how that's kind of grown over the last 
a uh, few years. And then um, 586, the MCCOA Senior Services, that's the county millage. Um, and that contract has been steadily increasing too. Um, when we put our numbers together, we try and be conservative. Um, it may actually be a little more than uh, 381, but that's what we're expecting this year, so we put it for next year. Um, good news story here. Uh, the Senior Center, after years and years of being underfunded um, in the last decade, has been funded adequately, um, and we're able to do a lot of great things for our seniors within the community. So, um, question on that. Yeah. It's great news. Um, examples of exactly why. Yeah, so um, I'll let Maureen answer this a little bit more, but you know, things like um, questions uh, on how does um, Medicare and Medicaid work, uh, how um, are we going to handle the new tax laws that have come down, um, down to very simple things like, um, you know, toenail clinic, foot clinic, um, things are, that are a big concern to our, to our seniors. Um, and then more recently, um, we've started doing um, a bunch of, of things that actually integrate the seniors into um, arts and parks. Well, you want to talk a little bit about some of those programs? Yeah, so um, some of our new programs we put out um, as we move forward as um, a community services department has been um, inclusiveness. So you have a broad spectrum of seniors. We're kind of a rare department. And in that, about 10,000 people become a senior each day across the United States. So how can we make um, our senior services inclusive? So as John mentioned, that would be our social work services all the way down to any um, community health programs we may have. But then how do we relate that back into our community services department? So some new things that we have done, um, we had our silver sampler program, which was extremely successful in the past, and that was our outdoor recreation program for people that wanted to be a little bit more active um, as far as recreating goes. But we also just started this summer doing our Picnic in the Park series, and that is also an opportunity to bring in public art, as Tina mentioned earlier, and other community education programs with being able to actually recreate in our parks. So the Senior Center covers the cost of a light picnic, and then um, we have individuals sign up, and we rotate to different parks in our you know, beautiful Marquette area and um, spend some time you know, congregating together and having that companionship, as well as an education component and um, a recreating component. So that's just one example so far um, of what we're doing with that. Um, so I hope that answers that question. That's just one example. <laughs> I'm looking a little bit more specifically on, and it could be something just as simple as, you know, we finally have enough money allocated to start funding these things properly. You know, yeah. and, that, and that, that's, I'm okay with that answer as well. But I'm wondering if there's something specific that we can, you know, maybe either celebrate or at least acknowledge to say, you know, we finally got our, our ducks in a row with the senior center, and, and here's why we're why we're being so uh, successful. Yeah, I'd say um, all of the programs that we have are very very important. The things that I've mentioned are very important, and I think that. Um, that we do finally have the resources to do some of these um, opportunities where, um, let's face it, the senior population is changing. So um, today's senior that is, that is a baby boomer that um, is retiring, um, they're not looking to do the same things uh, that yesterday's senior was looking to do. And those things are not necessarily inside a room, they're out there. And, and a lot of the reason why they want to be in Marquette is for the, the opportunities they have here. So we're now able to start to take them on these trips. Senior Sampler was mentioned. Um, that's an opportunity in the winter. They do uh, snowshoeing, they do snow biking, they do cross country skiing, and they have, we send them out with a qualified guide that's able to um, get them out there and actually Ex give them a sampling and, and whether or not they want to continue with that opportunity in the future is up to them, but it's building connections that are huge. So these folks are um, becoming connected to one another, talking to one another outside, which is really able to help um, with 
some of the isolation issues that seniors have, um, especially in the transition from work to uh, retirement. That can be a very big challenge. And then the, the silver sampler in the summer does all the things that we have available in uh, and around the area during the summer. So that's a transition and that's a, that's a, there's dollars associated with that that are huge. And th that wasn't something that we would have ever been able to do prior to um, all the, the funding opportunities that we have now. Um, and, and it's ever so important in this day and age, so. That's a good, excellent, thank you. Question if I can. Um, yeah. I noticed Nagani Seniors Center uh, often runs bus trips to strange and exotic places. Mm -hmm. I'm not being facetious there, I mean literally a week bus trip somewhere. Is that something you guys have ever thought about? Or does that make sense or is that floating around out there or just yeah, not something you want to Yeah, we're exploring the opportunity. We do get a lot of questions about that from our seniors and um, there are some issues with logistics of transportation and liabilities and things like that. Nothing but um, yeah, Nagani is, is running programs where they're even taking people to Europe. Italy, yeah. uh, Branson, <laughs> yes. And I, I would actually like to comment on that. Um, a lot of our individuals from our service area go on those trips. They open it up to Marquette residents. So Christy, mm -hmm. who's the senior center director there, does open it up to Marquette residents to attend those. Um, the downside to that is first come, first serve does go to Nagani residents before um, our individuals can go. She, but she also did say to me that those trips couldn't happen without the Marquette residents attending. She wouldn't have enough um, individuals to make the trip feasible. Yeah. Well, I'm not suggesting we compete. I mean, no, but, yeah. uh, <laughs> just that so we have that as an opportunity because I think that's, that's pretty unique and pretty interesting. And this year, um, we'll actually be taking um, some folks to Kitchity Kippy. Um, so um, providing that opportunity to uh, get them out to the more local resources, um, see what uh, the local area has to offer, and that's sort of a pilot into Great. things of that nature. Thank you. I had the opportunity to be, um, to attend an elder law, elder task, elder care task force, I think it was called. Elder law abuse task force, yeah. yeah. Um, and the questions of, there was so many legal questions I wasn't aware of around guardianship and the questions of, and helping, there's all these legal issues with the end of life and care at the end of life and then health costs at the end of life, this two hours of that with the Supreme Court Justice and the Attorney General. And it sounded like there's gonna be also um, potentially um, legislative action at, in Michigan certainly is on their agenda for coming up for the next year. So I don't know that that legal side of helping people navigate some of these legal issues. Is that also something that would be, you'd be doing here or it's more, it seems to be more this primary care. Not just th This is a big picture question. There's no right answer. It's just, what are you thinking? Yeah, not, not every um, service needs to go through our center. A lot of these things we can work with community <coughs> partners on. Um, if we have somebody come in and it's outside of our wheelhouse, we certainly work to pair them up with folks that specialize in that and get them to the right resource. Um, a lot of those questions our social workers can't answer, um, and some of them they can't. And so um, we're always looking for those community partners that can help us out in that way. Other stuff is I'm just curious. I mean, obviously, if you want to have a boat in a certain uh, marina, you know, you live in the city, you pay X amount of dollars. If you live out the city, you pay, uh, is there like a fee to seniors? Like say, if Mike and Fred are seniors and they want to go out and have fun with the seniors and Fred lives in the city, Mike doesn't live in the city, is there a, is there a difference in charge? Or what's the difference, I mean, just out of curiosity, are there a fee or? Yeah, we have a, a specific service area and maybe Mo can answer exactly how that works a little bit better, but um, primarily, um, there are there are opportunities depending on the program um, that vary on how you can take advantage of those. So anybody can that's in about that's a senior can go into whatever program they want to do. Yeah, for the most part, John um, summed that up really well. So as far as social work services go, if anybody needs help with social work, that would be um, information referral, financial management, um, homemaking, Medicare, anything like that. 
they would go um, if they were in Marquette City, Marquette Township, Chocolate Township, or Powell Township, mm. they would come to our center. Um, if they resided anywhere else, they would have to go to one of the other centers for those services. If it, as far as recreation and some of the more fun activities as you would like to think yeah. about them, uh, for the most part, they can come to our center and there's usually not a fee associated with it that's any different than what somebody else would pay. Um, however, that's not always the case. Sometimes it does depend right. on program. For example, if we do this fall colors tour trip, we will give um, <coughs> people that reside in our service area first okay. dibs and then reach out to the others if there is room. So basically, Fred would get over it. Fred would get to go on tour, but Mike gets to uh, take the bus behind or something like that. So, <laughs> I, so basically, that's good because I have a friend that's got parents that live just outside the city, and I keep on. They don't do a lot, so I just want to know if there's a fee or anything they had to pay. Good. So Mike sponsors. That's good. <laughs> Moving along. Yeah, the rest of page 160, um, I can say that the in-home uh, services expenditures are right on par for. Um, for what we have seen in the last few years. So um, if there's no question about 160, uh, we'll move on to page 161. Um, and this is actually the senior services allocation budget. So this is all the other things uh, um, and including some in-home services. Um, and really, um, I guess there there isn't a whole lot to point out on this. We've talked a lot about the services that are offered in the center already. Um, I would mention that um, 801 um, with the project of 50041, uh, that actually has increased um, this year. And that's kind of a good news story. Um, we've expanded the theater program, the senior theater program. Uh, to include the symphony and so there's some extra costs that go along with that but it was kind of a request um, from the seniors um, to have that opportunity to be exposed to that side of things and um, the senior arts um, component of the center has just been outstanding and and really well received um, within the community um, and again that's that harkens back to the the crossover between the two divisions and the reason why we have a staff that that um, that straddles that divide so um, I think that that's that's a good news story um, the other thing we've talked a lot about is um, 957 that's a silver sampler program uh, so there you can see um, the request this year is about a thousand dollars more and we're just hoping to do um, always a little bit more with that um, and the costs are always slightly increasing over time so um, and again that uh, that trip um, would be included in that in that line item this year and one last question um, yes. the, um, there's no Wi-Fi that I could find in the senior center is that is there no Wi-Fi down there I I hadn't realized it until Jen had tried to find uh, Wi-Fi yeah. down there so well, I guess I, I could say this. Um, Not that seniors need Wi-Fi. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think I think a, yeah. an ever increasing like number of. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was um, I was that's something we'll look into. It's not a a very difficult or expensive um, uh, thing to put in place. I will say that um, you know we are looking into you know what the future of the senior center looks like. Um, we did a study a number of years back and. Um, there wasn't a whole lot of interest in moving it to an existing facility in, in the city. Um, and there was minimal interest to a new build and there was um, a lot of interest in keeping it where it is. But that doesn't mean that that's what it's always gonna be. So we're, we're keeping our thumb on the pulse of, of that. And um, as we're doing repairs and, and sort of aesthetic things to the center, um, we're keeping that in the back of our mind, we, we might be looking at something different down the road, so. I am an AARP, AARP member, I'm just asking. <laughs> lots of youth theater, lots of youth members at the library that could help the seniors with the Wi-Fi. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions on 161? All right, thank you, Maureen. Moving along to page 188. 
I'm going to have Michael Anderson come up. Um, Michael Anderson is the Parks and Recreation Coordinator for Community mm -hmm. Services. Um, and a new addition to our team. Has it been a year now? A little over a year. A little yeah. over a year. I can't believe how fast the time flies. <laughs> but he's been doing a great job. Um, and for the next one, two, three, four budgets, um, he'll be sitting by my side. So he had a lot of work to do for this, this budget season. Um, Tourist Park is really a good news story. Um, we have, um, I think, done a, done a really good job with what we have, and we're really working toward the future with Tourist Park. Um, on page 188, you'll see um, the estimated um, camping revenue again is conservative um, we have it at three hundred and twenty thousand dollars it's been as high as three hundred and forty seven thousand dollars and seventeen um, but we're not through the year yet um, a lot of this a lot of times you see fluctuation it really depends on the weather so you have really rainy years like we had last year and, and you see revenues decrease if you have beautiful years you see it increase so um, I think that this um, this fact sheet's mostly unchanged from what we've seen, and I think it's um, showing a trend of, of, for the most part, steady, if not growth. Um, 110 campsites out there. I guess the at this time I'll point out too that um, we have the um, the restroom renovations out on the street for a contractor. So um, this again to remind you is renovating both existing bathhouses and adding a family pod uh, to each one. So it would be a, a unisex shower house added to each one. Um, and that's a, that's a great thing for accessibility. It's a great thing for traveling families. Um, anybody that has uh, any um, needs beyond um, the normal bathhouse, if they have an opposite sex caregiver, it's a great resource for them. Uh, dad with two daughters, young daughters, although they're old enough to do whatever they want now, so. <laughs> um, but back in the day, that was a challenge. So that's a good news story. Um, and uh, and we'll, be, we'll be getting that done yet this year, so. Um, any questions about page 188? Of course, Rippling River Resort is competition, but it appears it's not hurting Tourist Park at all. Yeah, we have. I mean, it's a beautiful facility. So. Yeah, I we have not really seen um, much of an impact. If anything, we're we're grateful that they're there. So, um, for a number of years, we had um, a short little list of all the surrounding campgrounds. So. Um, you know, the 60 days a year that we're completely full, we're referring uh, people out to all these other campgrounds. And now that's just one more thing on the list. So um, their fee structure is a little different. Um, I think their clientele is a little bit different. Um, we still see predominantly the people that have always come to Tourist Park. Um, but the camping population is increasing and there's just, there's not a ton mm -hmm. of campgrounds in the area. So. Um, we welcome the competition. Good, and I hope the city just continues to want to improve where they can, mm -hmm. such as the new bathrooms being yep. a big factor. Certainly, but other and things you know they like amenities and yep. So and we have um, we have trees which they struggle with, but <laughs> um, you have a lake. Yeah, yeah, lake. and there and there is a freshwater uh, lake that's not as cold as Lake Superior right there. Yeah, um, they but have Wi-Fi. yeah, we, and we do have amazing Wi-Fi now. But they do a little hot tub though. That's true. Heated, heated hot tub though. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, I w I would just simply say I think I think that it's a it's a good news story. <laughs> John, I, I was going to ask it on the next page, but it kind of follows up to Dave's question. Um, as far as like other municip municipal parks, are we on par? Are there, I don't know how many there really are, even are um, on par with like a fee structure for campgrounds and stuff like that. Are we similarly priced? Yeah, or could we, charge um, more? Just curious. we were. So the fees that we have now, we were at the um, 
in the higher tier of them for a while, but we're seeing across the country those fees going up. Um, you know, if you look at Rippling River, they're on the high end of that spectrum, but that's a brand new facility, so it makes some sense for them. Um, we um, we're right in the ballpark on where we need to be, and we did not increase those fees this year, but I would um, expect to see them increase a little bit next year with the new bathhouses and just keeping, as uh, the city manager mentioned earlier, small incremental changes is kind of the way that we like to go instead of trying to catch, play catch up. Okay. Any other questions on 188? If not, um, 189 was the fees that we um, just talked about. You can see um, $35 for full hookup per day. So uh, if you have done some camping with an RV, you know that that's right about the middle of where, where things are across the country. Um, we also have um, hammock stand rentals in there. Um, so we do have a number of these at the campground and we do request that uh, that they do not hook up to our trees. Um, vital that we have those and that they're healthy, especially in the campground. Um, and also we do experience people that come with nothing but a hammock to camp, so that's why we have the stands out there. And we'll be evaluating that program. It's rel relatively new and we have some ideas on how we can change it in the future. Uh, page 190, right yeah. John, I just had a question a resident asked me and I wasn't able to figure it out on the website. If you just want to go and park and go to the beach, does it, do you have to pay to park there for the day? Other campgrounds I know you have to pay just to access. No, there's no access fee at okay. Tourist Park. Thank you. Right. Okay. Hammock stands might not be available for future for the island maybe, or for like so just because you know, we always have issues with the island, possibly sometime maybe rent them out of Moose or something like that, possibly sometime. Uh, page 190 is the actual budget for Tourist Park. Um, revenues, again, we're usually fairly um, conservative with those, um, but we do anticipate things holding fairly steady. Um, as far as the, the expenses, um, I guess I'd point out uh, 740 um, operating supplies. We've got in 740 um, about $1,000 for um, some actual hammocking infrastructure, so it'd be some, something beyond just the stands in some of our primitive sites. Um, there'd be actual permanent posts um, that are kind of back out of the way so you can still use the tent. Um, so that's something we're, we're kind of working on. Some of the stands don't work for some of the bigger hammocks. So um, I'd also point out, um, in professional contractual 801, um, we've got about $5,000 in there for electrical upgrades. And what we're finding is that we have, um, we have some underground issues. A couple of pedestals tend to pop breakers and whatnot, so um, we've gotten a quote to replace the service line that uh, feeds that section. So um, we've got that in there. Lots of ongoing maintenance uh, with the site. Um, but good news story, it uh, usually comes out on the right side of the book, so. Do you have a lifeguard there? Yeah, so the fire department runs the waterfront safety program and they do have a lifeguard at the right. tourist park. Yep. Um, do I not see electrical on there? Is there not? Um, is power is 920, oh, power. about a third right. of the way down, yep. And that'll be in all these next budgets. Um, so you can see uh, about $23,000 a year we spend on power. And in one of the future um, budgets, we'll have a um, probably a, the beginnings of complete up electrical upgrade that we'll have to be doing in the next five to 10 years. So the RVs that are coming in are using more and more juice. Yeah. Some of them use more in my house. Any other questions on 190? All right. Yeah. Moving on to page 191. 
Um, this is Lighthouse Park, and um, we've added this whole budget um, since acquiring the park. Um, the fact sheet's pretty, pretty simple, pretty generic. We don't really have any program stats yet. But on page 192, um, this is the, the budget. And as we kind of look at this, um, I can point out a few things here. Um, number one, I guess the, the um, revenue, you know, we, um, we do get some revenue from the Maritime Museum and um, from their share of the um, ticket sales. So half of uh, the revenue from them uh, comes to us. And that goes back into um, the expenses of maintaining a very um, expensive historic site. Um, on the expense side, if you look at 740 operating supplies, we've got about $5,000 in there, and that's to try and get the short-term rental um, up at the captain's uh, residence. So there's ongoing supplies you need for that as well as um, the repair and maintenance, the $16,000 is what we think we need to do to paint and carpet and things like that just to get it ready. Um, so those are, are both revolving around that captain's residence um, and the expenses there. And we're hoping that eventually that would be a revenue generator for the whole site, um, as well as eventually a few years down the road the more complex renovation of the station house. So um, we do have in, yeah. Hey John, um, could you explain a little bit when we're thinking we'll have that up and running and do we have an estimate for our, how often we think it'll be rented out or what site we're gonna use, any of those details? Yeah, I think that, um, you know, if there aren't any complications to it, um, I don't see any reasons why we couldn't have it up and running next year, next season. Um, the construction is now um, completed, and that was really what we were waiting for. We, I mean, you can't really, can't really do something like that if you don't have the infrastructure in place. And first and foremost, um, the water and sewer was not ready for something like that. Um, so now that that's in place, um, we're ready to take the next step. So um, the goal is over the next um, winter to renovate that and to get it ready. And then as far as um, the appetite for that. Um, there's a lot of short-term rentals in town. There's a lot of a lot of things happening. There's seems to be a demand for it. As the city manager pointed out, we're getting near the cap for the number within the city. So I would hope that it'd be a fairly good revenue generator. But time will tell on that. Um, I know there's short-term rentals right across the street. Mm -hmm. How do we qualify? We don't have to comply with our own zoning. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I'm done. Good answer. Uh, President. Yes. Thank you, John. John, is the, the mergers and pay, that's the city owned buildings, the mergers and pays a fee basically to, mm. to operate. So mm -hmm. all the comment we've gotten this in the, during you know meetings about us upgrading the parking lot is to the city's benefit. So it helps out them with using the building and helps out everybody else. So. That, that's good that they pay rent. So it's basically, you want if you rent a building, you would think you have a nice parking lot. So it's not really to benefit anybody, but it benefits the city. So I think that's yeah. you should put that out. You know, the building where the Maritime Museum is is a city-owned facility, and so it's imperative that we take care of our city-owned facilities. So that was part of the project, and I think it uh, it sits pretty pretty nicely where it's at. We've got a little fine tuning to do, but we're getting there. Cool. Um. Professional Contractual 801, um, that is, there's some specific things, um, about $10,000 in um, site services, pest control, uh, alarm systems, things like that, that um, we just have to pay. But then also I've added um, a lighthouse engineers estimate of costs, um, $10,000. So we have a land use plan for this um, facility, but when it comes time for all these grants that pop up for um, for maritime and historic uh, facilities specifically, um, 
you got to have a hard number and, and really the consultants have put in their best guess on what it costs to replace the catwalk. That's not an engineer standing there and looking at it saying it's going to cost X point X X. Um, and so that's really what we want to do. We want to get those specific projects in the lighthouse down. So we have them in a book and when those grants come up, we can prioritize them and get them out. So, um, the first step to doing that responsibly, I think is, is getting those engineered estimates of cost. And so we've got that in the budget. Any other questions on the lighthouse park? Do All we right. have a ribbon cutting or anything? <laughs> Not really for the a ribbon cutting or something for the when everything's kind of. It does make sense. I guess we haven't thought about it, but um, I'll talk to the mayor and pro tem about it okay. coming up. Yeah, the, mayor would, the mayor would certainly support that. I think we just need to make sure we do it when we think we're done. So that we've got a good product to show, <laughs> and the neighbors Certainly are I think home. The community should have the right <laughs> to celebrate that that brand new park. <laughs> fence has to be down. Too. Yeah. <laughs> we could all just take one snip off the fence, and like they do for basketball nets. <laughs> yeah, they're they're supposed to be working on it this week, so. Well, just take your time. We can all buy less, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Let's re you could reuse the fence somewhere else. You know, put it in the other part of the rock, you know. <laughs> Moving on. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Next up is Presque Isle Marina, page oh 210. Um, this is the fact sheet. Um, the marina funds are, are really actually um, one fund, but we split them up so we can um, better articulate uh, expenses and revenues. Um, the good news here is that we are um, working uh, currently on a full uh, replacement of the dockage um, with one pier and 38 slips. And so um, that's fairly similar to what we have out there now since we've been decommissioning uh, slips as we've, as we've gone on along. Um, again, we've talked a little bit about that, and um, the goal is to um, have those out right after, have the boats out right after Labor Day, and we're working on a proration on that. Um, there also is a uh, fishing tournament the um, weekend after that, and we're looking to work with the contractor to have that open for that tournament. Um, so that's in the works. Um, Fuel is one thing that will be going away with the new uh, marina. And really when we kind of um, get into Cinder Pond, you can see fuel sales have historically been around $10,000 or a little bit more. Um, we're upwards, I think, of $70,000 in Cinder Pond. Um, so um, with the DNR's recommendation that you don't need them at every facility you have, um, we've moved forward because that's a very expensive portion um, of running a facility like that. Um, also of note, um, transient slip rentals. Um, we have typically just a small handful compared to Cinder Pond, um, and we're um, asking the DNR to waive those transient uh, slip requirements for the future uh, marina. So. We haven't heard back from them yet, but that's in the works. Hopefully the new marina gets built, uh, the, the transits will go up in there, hopefully. Mm -hmm. Yeah, typically the DNR requires 10% uh, be transient, um, but they do have exceptions when communities that have multiple facilities. So, um, so pretty straightforward on 210. Um, 211 is the already approved um, slip rates. Um, so these are transient um, for Presque Isle and for um, Cinder Pond, um, and that's based on based on the foot, the length of your boat. Um, pretty simple, but that's we we do that earlier in the year. So um, same with the next page on two twelve. Yeah. So our visiting friend the other night paid eighty nine dollars to spend the night. 
<laughs> um, let's see. No, it was more. Who did Cinder then? Oh, he's on the, he's on the wall. The municipal right? back. Yeah, it's a bulkhead right? locker. Like yeah, there's a. Yeah, it's it's a little bit higher for the bulkhead, but um, yeah, I think that was a couple hundred dollars. Yeah, cool. Three hundred. Almost close to three hundred dollars. Yeah. All right. <laughs> yeah. So then you didn't get a fuel for Jerry be crying for fuel more the input the fuel just tanks. <laughs> just again out of curiosity, um, when I, when people come in for training, like I feel like I see military and fire and rescue vehicles and stuff, and coming in for training and stuff is that in the transient or if you're just dropping the boat off and pick, bringing it back out, do you not get charged? How does that work? Um, no, we do uh, charge them, but if it is something that's municipal related, we'll often waive those fees. Um, so this this is really more geared toward people that are touring the Great Lakes. They want to come and stay, um, spend you know four or five days in Marquette, and then move on. Um, so that's that's the goal of this one. Okay. What's the fee for the boring field? You know, I talked to the marine manager for, and the certain times there's big boats that just decide to anchor out there instead of doing in the marina. They Obviously, they want to pay for the cheaper. Is there still like a fee for them to anchor out there? Yeah, that's a that's an interesting issue. Um, typically, we try and uh, get the marine manager to get a hold of them, um, and then we use our regular transient schedule for that. Um, but uh, yeah, it's, it's not allowed for them to just hook up without checking in with us first. So okay. it is an option if they want to be out there, but um, not. Uh, not stealth camping. So it's not a big no. deal, but at least they, they still fee. Mm -hmm. Gary still gets a couple bucks out of it. Yep, a couple bucks. <laughs> um, but on page 112 um, is the rest of the fee schedule. And again, these are 212, I'm sorry. Um, again, these are pre approved earlier in the year. Um, but uh, you can kind of see there's some changes throughout this. Um, with all of them, again, we're doing, uh, with the commissioner-approved policy, 5% increases every year um, based on um, on what was approved two, almost three years ago now. Um, and um, those are all kind of outlined there. There is some different slip sizes, too. We've got a 35-foot slip in there, and that just has to do with the way the new marina was designed. There's one that's 35 feet just based on um, how the service dock sticks out um, and the 45 foot slip um, was something uh, new this year too I believe no yeah that's new that's why right 45 yeah 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 other than that other than the the five percent increases in the new slip sizes that at uh, the new marine at Presque Isle no changes in fees. I know Zerger was on, he said that, you know, if the waiting list got big enough, they would, you'd be, have the opportunity to build another pier, possibly at Presque Isle, you know, mm -hmm. you room for it to add on to it. And you now, does he figure out how much are they going to lose revenue with all the slips for the smaller boats being gone or, you know? No, I don't, I don't think so. I think that, um, I think it's going to work out quite well. I mean, Time will tell how those those fill in, um, but we do get a lot of requests for some of the larger sizes at Cinder Pond. We, the people that are on the 32 and 38 foot uh, waiting lists are there for a long time, so um, this will hopefully help to alleviate some of that. Um, One other question from my knowledge, yeah. quickly: um, What's with electricity? And I've, I'm hearing about places downstate, friends who have boats in the water downstate, where they can't. They had to turn the electricity off the entire, you know, in the marina because the water's so high. Um, do we, are we, and that's, we're not going to have a, um, fuel out there. Are, is electricity also out there? And, um, yeah, so. You know, count the lake levels and stuff. Yeah. Um, the current marina as it stands and as it has been for the last 50 years um, is a fixed pier system. So it's a Benoit style system. The new one would be a floating pier. Uh, so it'll float up and down with the lake okay. levels. So, um, yeah, not an issue with that. We'd have issues with the land side of things before we'd have issues with the power at the docks. So, but yeah, something to look at is a maybe an extra fee or some extra discount for people in the first column. We were getting fuel at Center Pond because you know it's just like if you're 
by the market mall and you need gas, there's no gas station, you have to go to the Harvey to get gas, as places as it was is for boaters, you know, and Fred can mean to that. Powerboat's not a big deal, but sailboats can take a while to get in, you know, so just something to look at, maybe a little, like you said, you're giving them a discount for getting out of the water early to get the construction going, but maybe something to look at as a, having to go all the way to a center pond to get fuel, you know. Moving on. That was 212. If we look at 213, this is the actual meat and potatoes of the budget for Presque Isle. Um, and, um, you know, with this, we're doing the project this year, so you'll see the grant revenue um, and expenditures in the 2019 budget. Um, the, um, I guess the bottom line story, um, the number I'd like to point you to is sort of at the bottom under other, um, 997 Marina Reserves. So with this budget as proposed, um, if everything goes according to plan, um, we'd be putting about $7,615 into reserves. So um, really kind of working toward uh, that goal every year, increasing um, the revenue a little bit and um, looking towards sustainability in the future. So. That's that's something that previous commissions haven't seen a number in that line item, so we're we're getting there. Have we been doing general fund transfers into the marina recently? Not for the past few years, but that was the case until about I think probably around 2016, maybe it was the first year we didn't have to do that, and that's because the uh, staff at the time took a very aggressive approach towards building up the <coughs> rates so that wouldn't have to happen. So for the past few years, we've not had to transfer any general fund money into the marinas. I seem to remember one point we were doing, how much, Gary, 170 maybe, or? Yes, sir, it was usually between 100 and 200,000 each year we were doing that. We've come a long way, guys. Yeah, that's very interesting. That was my point, but. Mm -hmm. We'll Thank take you. We'll take a look at that line item on Cinder Pond too, just to <laughs> drive that one home. Um, other than that, there's there's no real um, out of the ordinary um, things here. I would expect this budget to be a little fluid as we get used to the new facility next year. Um, so there may be some changes uh, this time next year, but um, right now, uh, fairly similar. Any questions on the Prescott budget? Yeah. Line item 609. It goes from 3,200 to 8,000. How do you see the increase in launching permits? That's a big increase. Got it? Yeah, so I think we um, we had a lower number in, um, so if you look at previous years, it was about $9,000 generally. Um, I think we had a lower number in, in the budget last year because we were anticipating shutting that launch down for a period. And we will see that um, yet this year with the September fishing season. So um, just a... Uh, Inconvenience of uh, improvements. Um, so actually, if you have less slips, wouldn't you have more people launching? Maybe. Yeah. In the future, we'll take a hard look at that. But that was our best guess with the uncertainty of it. Probably less people launching will be from out of town. But the only problem is a lot of people travel light and expect to fuel up. But the people have to tow the boat heavy because they'll fuel up. Somewhere else, or maybe your in your increase will be increase at Cinder Pond, maybe because they'll only get fuel after they launch. So maybe you'll see an increase at Cinder Pond, possibly. Maybe. That's a good question. Any other questions on two thirteen? All right. Uh, Cinder Pond Marina. Um, so I guess. It's kind of hard to predict. I mean, the, the one thing that I'll, I'll point out here, um, we do have 101 slips down there. Uh, we do have full services down there in a, in a new marina service building, thanks to the winter of 
14. <laughs> 14. Um, and um, this marina has really been been sort of pumping out the numbers. If you look at last year for fuel sales there, um, or in 2018, I mean, almost $100,000 in fuel sales. We have estimated this year 75000 but I've been approving POs for fuel purchase like crazy, so I wouldn't be a bit surprised to see that exceed $75,000 in fuel sales um, this year. So um, the the fuel dock there is getting used quite a bit um, and much much more extensively than uh, the one at Prescott previously, um, almost by 90%. So if the guy Paul mentioned... Commissioner Slayo mentioned filled up there, your increase be a little bit. <laughs> um, I think the the mooring field number may be a little bit low. At the time we put this together, we had 11 in there. I think we have 15 in there now. Um, there's 23 of them out there. So um, that's pretty much it for the fact sheet on that. Any questions on? 214. Was the mooring field down this year? Because it looks like there are less boats out there this year, possibly, in years. But I know there's a couple, just to be, you know, full for many years, but it looks like there's a couple less boats this year. Yeah, I think it started off slower, and then uh, right. yeah, it's about what it was last year. Now, and people so. picked up a little bit. Yeah. Maybe with the less boats in the center pond, or first column, maybe people might take advantage of the mooring field, you know, sailboats, bar boats like to be at the dock, but sailboats might take advantage of that, so... Part of it too is there the uh, parking for the dinghy to get out to yeah. um, is a beach area and there's not much beach right not there right now, so yeah. they're kind of stacking them on top of each other. Maybe there. something like that, maybe like a dinghy storage for in Cinder Pond or something like that, because there's the you know place between the the first dock and land there, mm -hmm. possibly dinghy storage because like you said, there's not much beach left mm -hmm. to launch, so maybe might help increase trend. You know, people going to the mooring field if they have a place to. Launch and digging, don't worry about their boat getting washed away, which has happened a few times. So, right. Um, on page 215, the meat and potatoes of the Cinder Pond budget. Um, again, I'll, I'll direct you first down to um, that Marina Reserve uh, 997. Um, looking at putting, you know, approximately $51,000 into reserve this year. So, again, drastic difference between that and the past so um, definitely good news story um, won't be much after we get done building Presque Isle it'll be zero but yeah I don't know where where it is right now John question when does the is this the last year of the six years for that scale and then do we have to go back again no, the commission... Or is it just continuing? It's continuous. It's like so the same. Okay, yep. for some reason I thought it was a six-year. Yeah, we, you're thinking um, prior to that we had a 6% increase uh, like for seven six, years. Seven years, okay. And we adopted the policy that we're currently operating under after that, and it's a continuous. Okay. Eventually we'll have to keep an eye on that and evaluate it, but it is working at the time. So to look at John, maybe possibly his, uh, a lot of friends in Center Pond... Obviously, a sidewalk, you know, obviously, when it comes to Bar Park, but a sidewalk to go from, you know, the bike path down to the marina. I mean, I really don't know, a lot of people walk back and forth. Possibly sometime, you know, maybe get parks and rec to work on something like that or a contractor. And then, I've heard, is possibly get the pop machines back. That was very popular with many boaters, and maybe I don't know if you have them in the little wreck area or something like that, but I've heard a lot of boaters ask about getting pop machines back, you know, something like that next year. To uh, address the city manager's question, page 10, I put in a page that shows the various fund balances for each fund that we have. Uh, for the marinas combined, and you want to look at unrestricted, we currently have just over 447000 Now, some of that is needed to pay bills, but it's probably safe to say there's probably about 400000 in the reserve for the marinas. And again, we're looking at a um, in excess of a one point three million dollar project with waterways covering five hundred thousand. So, um, 
won't be much left after that project's done. Won't be anything left. Um, other things to consider on this um, item 801 uh, under uh, professional contractual. Um, we've got um, some of our standard maintenance stuff in there. So we've been working on reskinning the docks. Um, so those are the, the metal pans on the bottom side that keep the flotation in. Uh, over time, they do deteriorate, and we have to pull the dock and put new metal on the bottom. And then we um, are also um, looking at redecking ones that have issues on them. So um, constant maintenance. And then this year, we have a little bit extra in there for the fuel system. We did, did have a uh, valve failure on the fuel system. Um, luckily, the system was built with redundancy, so this particular valve is um, designed to, in the event of um, some sort of a failure, prevent siphoning from the tank into the lake, and um, code only requires one of these valves, so um, right now we're operating with one, um, and we have a fix for, for the other one uh, with the goal of getting it replaced in October. So. Um, considerable expense, but it's uh, it's in there for that. We like the redundancy, especially when we're talking about our Great Lakes. So. John, I, as I look at this, I recall the, um, the, yeah, the marina has an active life of about 20 years, mm -hmm. and we're getting close to 30, I think, aren't we? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, uh, really a testament to, um, to our uh, facilities division, their maintenance skills, and, and the work that they do every spring um, to put those things back together and to get ahead of things. But we're looking at a 2024 replacement of this marina. So yeah. um, again, um, you know the fee schedule and the policy that you all approved, fairly aggressive, um, but it's leading us into the future, um, to a future that is very responsible. So um, we're headed in the right direction to keep these facilities going on our great Lake Superior shores. So, thank and you. This is the tech fee doubling, mm -hmm. ongoing. Uh, um, so that gets put together um, by administrative services. And um, I think that might have to do, maybe Michael might have some more information on this, but um, we are trying to address the issue where we have our cash handling system in the uh, marina building and then the fuel is out at the end of the dock. Yep. Mm -hmm. So um, I think we're looking to put a new computer out there, right? Yeah, yeah. So the staff doesn't have to come back to the office to ring up a fuel sale every time. So those, those fees increase um, annually, but uh, we do have a little bit more expense there to, to get that service. So. At Fred Bergnome, and it's good that you found that they updated that because you know before it was hard when you went to get fuel and they had to wait to go all the way back to the, s the marina bow office back and forth. So it's good you have adaptability. They're just, they're, I know when I was uh, just at Sagnus this weekend in Mackinac, they've replaced a lot of decking with the plastic decking now. I had a plastic deck back that day, but it wasn't very good. But maybe it's something to look at where when the new piers get built, maybe look at plastic. I know DPW is always working on replacing boards. Something to look at. I don't know what the difference is, but something to look at, you know. Maybe look at the plastic deck instead of the wood stuff, you know. But twice as expensive as what yeah, we're hearing from flotation docking. No, no, that cheap. I know what the plastic is. I didn't have a good look when I had it, but yeah. something to look at, you know. But yeah. first thing, saying is they, I think there's a, Fred would probably know, I think it's a state built marina. I think there wasn't a city built marina. Mm -hmm. So, you know, cost difference. Any other questions on our marinas? Whatever floats your boat. <laughs> <laughs> oh, try. Uh, a little levity here, guys. Oh, uh, you know it's good. Uh, you don't use insulation at the end here, Paul. All right. Um, <laughs> moving on to um, page 116, or 216. I keep doing that. It's a good thing I got Gary here. Um, this is Lakeview Arena. Um, again, as we kind of move through this, I think that um, I'd like to point you back to the days when um, <laughs> we were putting a lot of money from the general fund into uh, Lake View Arena. I think at one point it was upwards of $600,000 a year. Um, so as we get into this, we're 
far below that um, now. Um, I think that, I guess with Lakeview, I'm extremely proud of the work that the staff has done to try and close that gap. So each and every year they're proposing budgets that are really um, aiming to trim any sort of fat out of it and really um, also some things that are, that are, I guess, geared toward increasing revenues in the best opportunities that we have. A good example last year was um, getting rid of that uh, green and gold pipe and drape and getting some nice black pipe and drape that's a lot more appealing for those summer events. So we saw summer events as a, a great uh, revenue opportunity. Um, you know, probably the most underutilized part of the facility is during the summer. Um, so uh, we have seen an increase in those events. Um, if you're looking down through um, this, we have all the, the staffing at the top and then um, I guess a couple things I'd point out. Marquette Junior Hockey, um, we're anticipating them. Uh, they've kind of given us some of their schedules already. Um, so they're going to be spending a little bit more this, this year. Um, and then the dry floor um, revenue, um, the dry floor events are hourly, really is, is, I mean, we're being conservative with that number at 27,000. We're anticipating hopefully it'll be a little bit more on, on the revenue side of things, but that's, that's a record for the last number of years. So um, that's really a good news story. Um, really, we're, we've seen, um, I mean, Northern is kind of um, trying to work in-house more and more. Um, so we're seeing some of their, uh, their revenue coming over to us. Um, they're prioritizing all the NMU's things. So um, when it comes to the ice side of things, we're, we're, uh, we think this is going to be a pretty good year. Yeah. I know this is a way out there question, but um, I have to, I, I have to ask, uh, this is, this is, this is for my husband, um, curling. Have we ever, I know we had it, what, Sunday nights at 10 o'clock or something? Uh -huh. uh, is that, do you think that'll ever uh, materialize again? Or are we going to, how'd that go? Yeah, so we still have it, right? Yeah, we still have the drop in curling once a week, Sunday nights. But I've been working with a few of the local curlers um, to try to, they're trying to put together more of um, a uh, curling club, an actual awesome. club where they can actually get together and rent ice and have a curling club night where they can just curl themselves so you don't have the because you can get visitors in and they spend money and go out to bars and yeah, yeah. yeah. that's really what curling is about so <laughs> it's canadian what can i say it's <laughs> my staff still reminds me of when we first got that in and i attempted the like three or four times i was on the ice you know that they still bring that up from time to time <laughs> it's, it's a lot harder than it looks yeah same thing with the sled, is the same thing with sled hockey possibly? Are they trying to do more, you know, so Mike could actually go out and play hockey or something against Blake or? <laughs> yeah, we've been, we've been uh, working with them and they're actually looking to um, rent a space in there to, to keep all the, the equipment. So um, that's, a, that's a good news story. Um, really gives the opportunity. And again, that's the, the cross between the different divisions. Um, that's an opportunity to reach a group that um, has a love for hockey but doesn't have the ability in the current uh, situation. A lot of fun to watch those guys on the ice. So, yeah. Sean, um, just an observation and from some people that did uh, talk to me about when they rent ice time for hockey, and I think there was a $20 increase. Is it per hour? Yeah, so the fees are on the next page, so page um, 217. And um, we're going up from 195 to uh, $200 an hour, so a $5 increase per hour. Okay. So. Um, so that makes me happier to hear that. And, and I realize, you know, it's hard to play favorites and you can't do this stuff um, without increases. And, and here I am chuckling earlier about the 2%, but um, in other areas. But the fact is, is that without these hockey players, without the teams, whether it's junior hockey or the mutineers or mm -hmm. girls hockey, the, the primary users of our facilities there, you know, the less that we can burden them and their families, the obviously the better. And that's why I'm so excited to hear that you're pushing so hard for the for the dry floor events and 
and everything else along those lines to hopefully offset that and not have those those right. just keep uh, keep going up. Um, you know, your girls and the sports that they're in, I'm sure you get it. Everything costs money, but um, wouldn't it just be nice to say we don't have an increase or or here's five bucks off or something every once in a while? So um, keep up the good work in that respect, and I hope that there's some day that we can do that. Yeah, I appreciate that. Uh, as I've mentioned before, we're always looking for ways to offset um, and not put the bur burden fully on um, the folks that use the ice. And you know, these summer events are really a great opportunity to do that. Um, I would point out, though, too, um, it's estimated now with the um, with the new facility that the break-even cost for an hour of ice is three hundred and thirty-six dollars. So. Um, if you go downstate, a lot of these these places downstate, you're seeing um, you know numbers upwards of four hundred dollars an hour. Um, so it's hard to increase locally when they get used to them. But um, if you look at um, energy costs going through the roof across the country, um, we're seeing huge numbers for hourly costs in other places and <coughs> other states and uh, even downstate. So. Um, we're cognizant of both sides of it and working hard to try and try and fix that. And on those lines, um, I'll bring it up and I don't, we don't have to necessarily go there, but I, you know, it's always on our minds, where are we with the, the bathroom uh, units in there? How are we doing with those types of renovations and handicap access and all those good things? Yeah, certainly. Ob obviously that's uh, on the tip of our tongues and, uh, and I can't imagine, you know, it's a big facility and I know you got your work cut out for you, but that's the stuff that, yeah. you know, what you see is what you, what you eat a lot of times. Right. You, you got to be able to take care of that stuff. And we'll certainly talk about all the Hockeyville dollars and the Friends of dollars and the improvements on the next page. Um, I guess uh, um, a few other things on this, um, this fee schedule that have changed. Uh, Citizens Forum uh, went up. Um, a few dollars, and that's um, similar to a 2% increase. Uh, we used whole numbers, though. Um, um, parking lot event and um, some of our other uh, fees, like the tables and chairs, went up for the uh, first time in, in quite some time. Um, so uh, those are things that, that work toward covering the cost of replacement now. So tables and chairs, we're getting to the point where we're we do a little bit every year, but we're going to have to be a little more aggressive, and the costs have gone up, so um, we're trying to cover those there. Any other question on the fees? With the advertising, mm -hmm. is that full? Is that a spot? Like, how does that? How do you guys feel about that? And should there be? So, um, it's a it's an interesting gig, and twice now, two years in a row, we've put out a request for proposals for an advertising agent to take this over and actually go out and do the door knocking and try and um, solicit those ads and then um, pay us the, the per square foot um, just to have mm -hmm. that up. Um, and we haven't gotten any takers, but we're gonna continue to pursue that. Um, in a small town, you know, having every dashboard have an ad on it is pretty rare. Um, but it's definitely something that we, we see as an opportunity. Um, and so we'll continue to work on that. We don't have the time to actually do the door knocking ourselves, but. That's what I was kind of getting at, yeah. that, like staff time into mm -hmm. versus yeah. that revenue. Piece. But if we have somebody that wants to take the initiative, I think it'd be a lucrative thing uh, for one of the local advertising groups. So. Any other questions on 217? All right, 218, um, this is the Lakeview Arena budget. Um, I guess I'd, I'd, uh, I'd point out um, the revenues, um, ICE rental, yeah, we're looking to um, be about where we were. We're a little conservative on that. Um, with the increased fees, it might be slightly more than that, but we always kind of shoot a little bit conservative. Um, arena events, um, looking to be up on those. Um, and then we have uh, the transfer in from the general fund. So this is the number that we kind of look at every year. Um, 
and this year it's estimated to be about 231,000. So um, if that, if all holds true, that'd be the lowest number ever. So that's a good news story. Yeah. Uh, city manager just brought up the um, the impact of the JCI project. So um, this was a, a facility um, probably most heavily impacted by that project other than the wastewater tra treatment plant. Um, a lot of stuff happened, all new compressors, um, sensors in the ice pad, all new uh, LED lighting, um, HVAC upgrades, upgrades. Um, and that's really kind of reflected in um, uh, power 920. So even with the BLP increases, um, we're anticipating $150,000 power bill this year um, versus 180 to 225 in the past. So, um, and remember the BLP rates are much higher than they were. So um, that's a good news story. Some of that was accomplished uh, by switching out the, um, we have two meters for Lakeview now where we always had one. And when you have high usage, you get a demand charge. And with Lakeview, it's the highest possible demand charge. So to have the BLP ready to supply the most amount of power that you use for the entire year, there's like an $8,000 a month uh, fee for that. Now that we have two meters, um, that fee is only applicable for uh, half the year and it's a lesser fee. So um, we shut the ice plant off completely this time of year, so. John, I think you should give yourself a lot of credit because 150 grand this year, or next year rather, 180 the year before, and 197 I think in 19, what am I looking at here, 19, no, 227 in 18. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, you have had a very dramatic savings and we should uh, we should be proud of that. And not only not only that, um, but the the efficiency of it is much better too. So the quality of the ice it's much harder ice. It's much even uh, we did have a power outage and it took a lot longer for that ice to start to soften up um, last year than it would have in the past. Um, but we also have redundancy now, so we can plug a generator and run the ice. What our citizens so. will never be happy with is not the quality of the ice, it's the money we're saving. Yes, <laughs> yes. I think along those lines, it would be nice to be able to either show, even th the 30,000 is a humongous you know, feather in the cap, mm -hmm. but if you can go back and, and gauge this versus you know, prior to the price increases, where we would truly be if we didn't have that, that mm -hmm. rate increase, that would be, you know, one where you sit there and do a jig, right? Because mm -hmm. that's going to show that much more of a savings. And how many times we as commissioners get asked, you know, is this JCI program a bunch of business or is it actually working? Um, and it's really easy to, to show that it's working when you're talking about showing 30,000s in savings. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, if there's something that we can have, material that we can share, that would be a really big... Uh, mm -hmm. Nice way to deflect yeah. some, some action. And make JCI do the calculations, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. They, they, they'll tell us the story so it's not stacked yep. on. Yeah, they're responsible for that, so. Yeah, I think I think it is a, a great, great news story. Hey, John. So I just wanted to say last year that this was probably the biggest uh, sticking point I had on the budget, and I'm really impressed with how far we've come. Mm. Nice job. I know not all of that is you, but you've been working hard in your department. Well, okay, <laughs> I guess it's some of the city manager too. But. <laughs> anyway, um, I know that we've got still a ways to go, but yeah. almost $100,000 savings from one year to the next. That's huge. Nice job. A um, few other things to point out on this one. Um, I guess, um, you know, if we look at uh, 801, we've got um, the shower valve replacement in uh, 801, so that's really, we're looking to replace all the shower valves um, at a tune of about $22,000. Uh, Michael's been working hard to get uh, folks to uh, come in and give them quotes on that, and I think we're about ready to just say we have what we have and, and work forward on that. Um, so that's that'll be a good news story. Um, I think uh, the police chief 
really wants hot showers sometime next winter, so um, we're looking to help him out with that. Um, also in 976, um, Olson glass replacement. Um, that would be a Hockeyville reimbursed uh, expense, and um, it's something that uh, all the parents have really requested, and we're looking to upgrade that system uh, to a system that will allow them to see their kids on the ice. So um, excited about that. That's about $60,000. And then the capital that we have um, uh, planned for this year is uh, the Russell boards and glass system replacement. Um, that's about $200,000, although um, we may see some revenue from sale of the existing glass. The glass is newer than the, than the, uh, the boards are. The boards are about shot. So um, all in the business of keeping the facility running. So definitely good fun projects. Um, I'd also mention um, the Friends of Lakeview Arena. Um, they had a, a chunk of change, and uh, you may recall er earlier this year they were inquiring about that. And we've really worked with them uh, over the year. Um, if you look in the lobby, there's new tables and chairs. Um, so hard surface tables, not the ones that came from Shiris Pool. Um, so we got those um, in there. Um, we're looking to replace the counter in um, the concessions area and um, relocate the skate shack so it's more uh, accessible for both arenas. Um, and then the concession floor replacement. And those are all things that the friends have, have committed to paying for. Um, and we're halfway done with that and working on um, the rest of it for this year. And the only other thing, um, if there are, well, depending on how those Hockeyville projects work out, if there are, um, some dollars left over from that, we may be looking to um, do some door replacement and door lock replacement in the locker rooms. Um, it's kind of an issue um, with that they have downstate the need to lock those facilities so when you're on the ice, nobody can go in there. We haven't really had an issue with any of that, but um, the visiting teams are used to seeing it, so um, we do get some complaints on that, so we're, we're interested in pursuing that if we have some Hockeyville money left over. If not, we'll get in a future budget. That's all I had. Any other questions on Lakeview? Sean, how much money is left in Hockeyville? Um, we had about um, $98,000, I believe, in that neighborhood. Still, you still have that? Yep, and that would be used up with these two projects, so. Strictly for improvements. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yep for the showers and for the glass and then potentially for the doors. What was it, the people were complaining about the showers? The, that group came in here and mm -hmm. that's been taken care of? Yep, and then the other issue they had at the time was the the women's accessible restroom was out of order and that was a maintenance issue. We're waiting on a part. It's all fixed and, and good to go now. Um, good, good. Future um, projects, future capital, um, I think the following year, next year, you'll see a capital improvement that would be, um, I'll have to verify the, the year to make sure it's next year, but um, handicap door openers and accessibility within the building, so mm. working toward that. For Citizens Forum as well, and the mm -hmm. whole, the whole yeah, estate? Both, both sets of doors, three sets of doors, so. Um, how did the concert go, and is there plans for c more concerts coming in dry floor? Um, so, uh, Double Trouble DJ, uh, the folks that put that on, and um, I think they were really excited about it. I think they liked the venue. I think they liked the atmosphere. I don't think they liked the weekend. Um, okay. So, uh, that holiday weekend, I think people just left for that holiday weekend. So, um, I think they're looking to try a different, different weekend, so we're hoping to see more concerts at Lakeview. Um, it's been kind of a goal of all of ours since we all started at the various different times, so. So look for that. Cool. Lots of good times back in the day. <laughs> I'll say back when, so back when Mike was in charge of the police force, there were lots of concerts at Lakeview, but now Blake's in charge. There's not as many, so maybe Blake's more strict. That could be why, you know. Maybe Mike was the concert shows. <laughs> Any other questions? Any about further Lakeview? questions? Hearing none. Thank you very much. Thank you all. Uh, that concludes our budget night uh, and leads us to uh, public comments.
Comments may not exceed three minutes per person. Please state your name and physical address when making public comments. Margaret Brum, 404 East Magnetic Street. I sat here the first time listening through everybody realizing I had to clarify my remark. I'm not concerned about the water intake to Presque Isle. I'm concerned about the intake to the one fire hydrant on Presque Isle. The wastewater treatment plant has assured me that water to the city, they've, they've got that covered, but there's just one fire hydrant on Presque Isle. I don't know how they get the water in, but if it's just a pipe underneath the road into the lake, that's the only part that I'm concerned about, somebody clarifying. Thank you. Commissioners, comments? Anyone? Looking at a sea of shining faces. <laughs> I'm just affirming the terrific job that you're all doing, and I think you're exactly, this is what makes Marquette a great place to live, and thank you all so much for all the good work you're doing. Thank you indeed. And seeing none, city manager, anything? Much better. Garrison is sad when the street's done. 